Hi, everyone, and welcome to the panel. Today, we'll be speaking of the role of apps and tech in psychedelic treatments. Um, as drug development has progressed over the past few years, we've been hearing more and more about how technology could help make psychedelic assisted therapies more affordable and accessible. But there are a lot of questions that have yet to be answered. What technologies are helpful within psychedelics? How big of a difference could they actually make in treatments? How big of a role will they have once drugs come to market? We have here with us three panelists who are gonna give their thoughts on these questions. We have Kelsey Ramsden, the president and CEO of MindCure, Ronan Levy, the co-founder and executive chairman of Field Trip Health, and Reed Robinson, the chief medical officer of Novamind. I'm gonna turn it over to our panelists to let them introduce themselves. Kelsey, do you wanna start us off? Yeah, absolutely. So hi, I'm Kelsey Ramsden. I'm CEO um, and co-founder of MindCure where we fundamentally have two, two divisions. So one is a digital therapeutics division that we're gonna be talking most about today. And then the second is a drug development division. So I won't belabor the time with a longer intro. I think we all know what we're here for. So with that, maybe uh, pass it along. Thanks, Ronan, go ahead. Sure. Hey, I'm, I'm Ronan Levy, one of the co-founders and the executive chairman of Field Trip. It seems I spend most of my time doing panels with Kelsey and or Yeji at various times of the day. But uh, at Field Trip, uh, we're doing two things. We're building out uh, the clinical infrastructure to deliver psychedelic assisted therapies at scale, which includes a couple of technology components, uh, as well as drug development division, Field Trip Discovery, that's developing next generation psychedelic molecules that we think can build on and improve the existing psychedelics. Not that there's anything wrong with them, but it doesn't mean we can't do better as well. Uh, so that's Field Trip in a nutshell. Thanks so much, Ronan. And last but not least, Reed, go ahead. Hi, I'm Reed Robinson. I'm a psychiatrist and chief medical officer at Novamind. And my background is in clinical trials and psychedelic medicine. I've been working with ketamine for over 10 years in research and clinical settings, and have built and sold a research site, uh, including a data science focused CRO. Um, we got back into clinical work uh, in recent years with this mental health revolution that's happening, uh, founded a clinic and research site, grew it to four, and then uh, joined forces with Novamind when we were acquired. And uh, we did over 20,000 client visits last year. We've given uh, over 4,000 doses of Spravato, many more of, of ketamine therapy. And uh, so this, uh, I'm happy to be here. Looking forward to the discussion. Great, thank you guys all. Let's just jump right into our first question. Um, and I sort of want to start off generally here so our audience can get a sense of where current apps and tech is right now in the psychedelics industry. Ronan, I'm going to kick this over to you first and Reed and Kelsey, feel free to jump in. What is the actual benefit of having these apps and other technologies in psychedelic based treatments, you know, in terms of reducing time commitments, as well as cost, as well as other things, you know, if you could give tangible numbers here that could help our audience understand how big of a difference these things can make that'd be really helpful. <laughs> Sure, but I think you answered uh, the question in the nature of the posing it, which is, you know, I think the biggest challenge we're facing, not challenge, more of an opportunity uh, we're facing in the emerging psychedelic industry uh, altogether is really the the costs and time frame associated with accessing high quality psychedelic therapies. You know, there's nothing that stops someone from running out and taking mushrooms in the woods and having a great experience. But when we're talking about it from a truly therapeutic perspective, then you're really involving the time of psychiatrists like Reed. You've got a uh, therapist, maybe two therapists present. You have psychedelic experiences that last four, six, eight, 10, 12 hours. Um, you know, just the direct costs uh, of the care plus the spaces, because we know that set and setting matters, um, plus the opportunity costs of missed work and, and, you know, taking a day off work for these therapies, you can appreciate how expensive these therapies are. So the role of technology fundamentally uh, is going to try to uh, achieve two things in my mind. One is reduce the costs uh, by limiting the amount of human hours involved in the delivery of care to the extent possible. There's certainly an element where I think human interaction is essential to the outcomes, but maybe we can parse that as much as possible or, or split the cost somehow. Uh, and then there's using technology to amplify and magnify the experience, either in terms of preparation or with music, you know, wave paths, 
and other platforms are working on technologies, generative music that can enhance or direct an experience. And I think those are the two opportunities I, I foresee uh, with technology in the short term. In terms of putting uh, dollars and cents or numbers around that, it, it's, it's really hard to say. I mean, we know what it costs, you know, psychedelic therapies using ketamine, you know, on average are, are $500 to $1,000, give or take per session. Uh, when it comes to MDMA and psilocybin, it's going to be even more because there are greater timeframes involved. How technology brings that down, really hard to say at this point, but I think there's a lot of people, including the, the three people around this conversation that are keenly working uh, to try and improve it step by step. I might add just a couple other things to this idea of um, cost and, and the value prop. I think part of it too is, and a mass of data to help unlock insurance payment. I think um, with the way that we capture this data, the way that we synthesize it and, it and inform payers on the net benefit. So we actually have some data to help compare the A versus B case and how we can help them start to pay for psychedelic assisted psychotherapy is a big piece. And then I think another piece is this idea of personalized care. So um, modernizing the care the care model in a way that we're able to allow individual patients their own journey through that, that to Rona's point earlier, may require a little bit less human interaction, but still provide them that personalized experience, I think is going to, you know, we have a, a large population of psychedelic naive people for which the psychedelic experience will be a first time. Uh, and I think the more that we can personalize and, and invite those people into their sessions and into their work and integration in a, in a pragmatic way that we can monitor and uh, drive new data will allow that personalization and increase the adoption curve, which is, I think, what we're all also keenly interested in as well. And I'll, I'll just add that uh, I agree with all that. And um, I see a huge value in data and tech in um, like uh, we've all been like we've all been discussing increasing access to care by in a number of ways, like everything from education, reducing stigma, but also uh, using real world data to um, enter this new era of measurement based care, or I like to call it. You know, not just evidence-based practice, but practice-based evidence. So in real time, we're um, individualizing the treatment, but we can also share data, like Kelsey was saying, with uh, payers to show them the value, the cost effectiveness of doing these new and improved uh, therapy approaches. Now, I want to touch on something that Ronan said earlier. Ronan, you mentioned that ketamine therapies could last several hours. Other drugs that are coming in through the pipeline, they could last even longer. In terms of the technology that we have right now that could help reduce that, exactly how much reduction are we talking about here? I, I don't think um, the technology per se, at least the technology I'm familiar with now in terms of pure, you know. Sorry, I meant reduce like the human oh, time yeah. needed. Yes. Well, I mean, if you think about how care can be delivered, you know, um, almost many aspects of all medical care can be delivered remotely if you have the right technology in place. So, you know, as, as a simple example, if someone comes into a field trip health center uh, anywhere in North America, you know, we've got a finger monitor measuring their blood pressure at all times and, and their oxygen saturation rates and, and all that kind of stuff. Um and, and we have a nurse monitoring on site and, and all that kind of stuff because it's the highest quality of care. And, and to Reed's point, we've, we're still dealing with stigma and, and, and changing attitudes. So we want to ensure it's always been a fundamental thesis at Field Trip that we've got to, you know, go over and be up, be over and above the standard of calling right now because there's so much skepticism and doubt. And so we have to overcome that. You know, we, we probably go over and certainly you see it in the MAPS trial where there's 84 hours of therapist time for, I think, each MDMA assisted therapy session, which is great, but uh, probably a little bit of an overstep just to ensure the quality of outcomes. Uh, and so going back to the simple example of field trip, you know, in theory, you could monitor a person's blood pressure remotely. Uh, you could measure their oxygen saturation rates remotely. You don't necessarily need someone sitting there right beside you. And, you know, we see companies like Mindbloom and the delivery of home care uh, with ketamine assisted therapy. I don't think that's a realistic option anytime soon for MDMA or psilocybin. Um, but that's one example where technology could be used, where people don't necessarily have to come to the clinic. They could do it from home and you could measure all of these, I think, important medical considerations. Is that going to impact 
you know, the value of the therapeutic experience to the extent that the feelings of energy or empathy from someone sitting next to you, as opposed to a zoom screen is, is going to potentially have a negative impact on the outcome. We're still going to face that, you know, zoom is not going to, I think, address that limitation anytime soon, but we can start to chip away at it such that we can give a good quality experience, give good therapeutic outcomes, even if it's not necessarily the best quality experience or the best, um, uh, therapeutic outcomes uh, with technology as, as very simple examples. And then, you know, with the apps that we have, for example, Trip, uh, having meditations, information that people can watch in, in advance so they can come in prepared and be in the right headspace and mindset before uh, the experience, all of these little things. I mean, none of them seem entirely revolutionary, but each incremental step, I think, moves things along quite a bit. Yeah, I think... Just to add to that, this idea of tracking the patient journey is, I think, a way to look at and orient where can we inform the care in a way where we may minimize the one-to-one -one hourly human interaction and how can we adapt that with technology. So I'm not sure, you know, to your point, I'm not sure about the in-session piece, how much we're going to be able to pull out the human element uh, entirely when we're actually under the effect of the psychedelic. But I do think you know, there's a lot of opportunity before and after when we think about screening, when we think about options for prep work, when we think about, again, some of the scientific or, or psychedelic naive folks and in, in, in offering them breath work so that they can experience altered state and get to normalize and understand how the oncoming of some of these experiences can look. So we can do a lot of prep work in advance that we don't need another human being. Um, and then, you know, on the, on the after side of that, one of the things that we built into our tech platform is natural language process journaling. So we can have people journal and, and they can just, they can type it, they can audio it and it's scraped and I'll peed. And then we get sentiment maps that feeds back to the therapist. So the therapist also doesn't have to spend as much time, you know, in your, how you doing checkup. The first 15 minutes usually is just not accurate data. It's just like, how maybe I was in the last 24 hours, people tend to have a hard time really tracking how I was actually doing the last two week period. And that, and so we can not necessarily skip that, but we can uh, increase the relevancy in the, in the, and our confidence in that data. So we can abbreviate that period of time. So again, it's, I think part of it is just looking and parsing down and like breaking each little piece in a way that we can, you know, try and scale away from time drag, but also, you know, help the patient feel like they're, they're a colleague in their own care. I also think that's a big part of psychedelic medicine is getting away from this, someone telling me how I am to heal and also just onboarding ourselves as a part of our own healing journey. It's an important piece of that. So, so helping people to do that on their own um, with the wingman of the, of the tech, I think is a, a part of the thesis of this type of healing. I think someone should brand their technology wingman. Uh, that, that's wingman. awesome. <laughs> we're, do, we're about to undergo a, a, a review and we actually did consider wingman, but then we're like, ah, it's a whole gender thing. And so yeah. I appreciate though, you know? Uh -huh. I feel like there's probably a dating app somewhere called wingman. That's uh -huh. true, yeah. Uh -huh. true. Uh -huh. I'll be did your goose. To Kelsey's point, I'm just gonna, uh, sorry, Rita, if you're gonna hop in, but it, a thought just came up as you we were talking, which is like, I mean, I know, I know we're talking about technology and, and this kind of veers us away, but I think it is a relevant consideration that I think we need to re re-examine like what psychedelic medicine is, right? Like if you really think about what we're doing throughout a psychedelic experience and the therapeutic process is like, yes, we're affecting someone's neurochemistry and neurobiology. There's no doubt about that, but really the benefits seem to come from the lifestyle changes, right? Like mm -hmm. we, I think we all recognize that good mental health is not just about fixing your brain chemistry. It's about exercising. It's about eating right. It's about doing the work to build resilience, emotional resilience, all that kind of stuff. So if you think about psychedelic medicine, really more about being about psychedelic lifestyles, being enabled by psychedelic drugs, um, you can start to see how technology can be an infinitely relevant platform for, for the work we're doing. Yeah, I'm just sorry, just to take it over time on that point too, a lot when we were building out the tech, such a big part, we did a, a 12 week sprint that was a bunch of interviewing from like patients, the therapists, clinicians, whatever the case, uh, researchers, and a bit, a resounding piece of the feedback was the best data is captured when people leave the building. Like that's where the real change happens is when we do the integration work, when we change our lifestyle. 
Um, so that was a big part of our kind of aha moment was interestingly, the most relevant and insightful pieces of what we can glean from what happens for folks outside of, you know, to your point, I'm putting on um, neural monitors and releasing really what's seeing what's happening in the brain chemically. Uh, but the human experience, the transformative experiences, once they leave the building and they're outside of all of our purview. So I think that's where technology really gives, you know, the X factor. I, I love that. I'm glad you added that, Ronan, because I think as a clinician, that's really where the rubber meets the road, where the magic happens. I've always um, been blown away by the fact that we can do a lot during a one hour, two hour, three hour therapy session, but but that's got nothing on the, you know, dozens and dozens of hours in between before they come back next. And uh, so that's a, a really good point. And uh, I agree with, with what tech can do. Um, a couple other things we've done on that therapy hour piece is we've been doing some psychedelic assisted psychotherapy in group settings, like especially with ketamine, um, where uh, it not only reduces the number of therapists needed, but leverages the healing power of group and the sense of community. Um, you know, we've deployed integration tools via technology beforehand, and even the screening and prep tools and assessment measures before each visit or, or to see if uh, someone is suitable for a given therapy. Um, and then one other point is if, if we're looking at S-ketamine as a as a psychedelic type medicine, the FDA approval came with it a two hour mandatory monitoring post dose in office. But now, thanks to data coming out um, and reanalysis, that there are some exceptions being made for certain individuals who are extra safe or doing well on it. Um, and I think we'll see similar things going forward in uh, different medicines as things progress. And if we can kind of pull together collect data in a good way and analyze it proactively, then we can, we can uh, uh, help regulatory authorities uh, do you know, reasonable, safe and effective things in terms of the, the rules and guidelines around it. It was a very good point you read, uh, made to read, which is like, we, we've got this, uh, I mean, just like how we think about what medicine is, is very narrowly defined. But if we think about it in the context, the same with technology, right? Like our, our default is technology must refer to something that involves silicon. Um, but technology, like just innovating on group therapy is actually technology in itself. And if we kind of open our mind and just give flexibility in the perspectives, you can see how there's lots of opportunity to use technology to actually enhance uh, the whole experience. Rita, I also feel like you made a really good point about the fact that, you know, certain treatments are only approved by the FDA and other regulatory bodies for like to have certain time periods and to have certain, you know, uh, like a certain time in which patients have to be monitored. And so all the technology that's being developed now, it's really going to depend on what's actually going to be approved down the pipeline. Um, Kelsey, I want to turn to you for a second. MindCure has its own digital platform called iStream. Can you tell us a little bit about, you know, how that platform is geared towards psychedelic treatments that's different than, let's say, a more generic health tech app? Sure. Our focus is really on the B2B market, so working with therapists um, and helping therapists work with patients. So the app was informed, like I say, by a bunch of pre-work uh, so if we describe it in simple terms, it's a wingman for the therapist and for the patient. So um, for the therapist, it provides uh, a lot of tools on bringing people into the clinic, helping them orient, doing the screening, all that kind of thing. And then they're also provided with a repository of psychedelic protocols. So if they want ketamine for pain or ketamine for depression, um, as well as distribution of other protocols. So working with folks in the industry right now to bring in, say, um, ketamine for alcohol use disorder that comes with um, a bank of data that in, that was informed by the clinical trials so that therapists can track their patients and patients can track themselves to how the, the average set of patients perform during that, during that time. Uh, and then conversely, for drug developers and protocol developers, giving them a way to distribute their protocols so that they can generate a greater amount of revenue. And then in session, some tools like uh, Ronan mentioned, WavePass, they're doing some cool things with music. We've been working with an organization called Lucid, 
So we developed um, an emotion palette. So in session, the therapist can actually drive sentiment. So if uh, someone wants to take a patient from, say, excited to calm, um, and what makes you calm is like Stravinsky, and what makes me calm is, I don't know, LCD sound system. Whatever that music is, it's going to biometrically, you know, you're being monitored. Uh, the music set can move you in the right direction. And then there's different buckets of music by molecule. Anyone who's done some work, say, with psilocybin versus like a San Pedro knows that you put some psilocybin music on when you're listening, when you're under the influence of San Pedro, it's like horrific, uh, but vice versa. So doing some interesting tools for the in session to amplify the set and setting in a way that gives a therapist a lot more control. Um, and what we found, though, interestingly, like tying back into this bravado piece was we've been approached by uh, the team over there to help them orient to how how technology can be um, helpful at the clinic level to increase adoption. And we're starting to get inbound from non psychedelic therapists. We built it to kind of be drug agnostic. So this idea that the healing process can be um, quite similar you know, for all folks, as oftentimes people want their patients to journal and they don't, all sorts of things that can be applied across a variety of healing modalities. But to your point about legality, I think it's also important to talk about a lot of these medicines are legal in different jurisdictions around the world. So the beauty of technology is it allows you to stand up an environment in a different jurisdiction and get access to those protocols and access to healing in that area. So I know, um, some of the folks on this call have, you know, locations in, say, Amsterdam or down in South America. And so with the technology, it just allows you scalability to go, OK, great. We we are doing ketamine now because it's legal in the States. And we're going to be doing psilocybin in this jurisdiction. We're going to be doing. Um, so that, of course, you know, creates a more ro robust data network as well for the AI to learn off of and consistently improve. It's it's sometimes I'm talking about even as coming out of my mouth. I'm like, this is just such a, a insane future to be living in today that we're developing all of this. I don't know how you guys feel, but then I think about what about five years from now? What about 10 years from now? Like we're just talking about kind of table stakes. I feel, I don't, I don't know what you guys think, but this forecasting for the future and what technology can ultimately unlock across all these molecules. It's really, uh, it's a great time to be working on this. It's, uh, I've been reading uh, Sapiens by Yuval Noah Harari. Mm -hmm. I don't know if anyone's read that, but he, he talks about how, um, you know, the agricultural revolution wasn't like this grand flash in the pan. Then all of a sudden we go from a hunter gatherers to being village livers, that it was like the slow incremental process. And all of a sudden, you know, humanity found itself living in villages and being farmers as opposed to hunter gatherers. And it's actually one of the things that I've been thinking about quite a bit recently, which is like, Psychedelics aren't going to like, we're, I don't think we're going to see that uh, counterculture hippie, like complete uh, rejection of all kind of normal capitalist values, like we saw in the 60s and that subset of culture. What we are going to see is people move very incrementally. Like, well, what does it look like if every person on the planet is is 2% more emotionally resilient or 2% more present as a parent or anything along those lines? And when you stack that up across millions or hundreds of millions of people over a couple of generations, it becomes actually unfathomable to think about what the future looks like because it's no, it can't be linear anymore. Um, so I, I really like that point, Kelsey. Mm. I know it's not on the topic of technology, but uh, it gets gets my. Well, technology is an amplifier, right? It's it's the it's the to the power of when we like. Um, yeah. I was reading something about the adoption of the telephone, and so the telephone. I don't know. I'm going to make these numbers up because I I can't recall. But let's say it's like 1915 or something. The first kind of telephone, and by the time it scales up and it's globally adopted and it's in more than 80% of homes or something. It wasn't until like the eighties, which was shocking to me, but you know, globally. Okay. Fair enough. And then, but then we saw cellular phone adoption was like, let's say that was 60 years or something. Cellular phone adoption was over a period of, I think it was 12 years or something like that. And then we see the adoption of um, apps and that, you know, so it's almost like this like half life young effect. And, and I think the ability to, to give people like, you know, what you guys are doing, the access to apps that help to educate and inform them as a pedestrian person, even before they've gone into true therapeutic psychedelic assisted psychotherapy, just unlocks that that the the A 
moment for psychedelics. Mm. So it becomes a little bit of the normalized culture. I would say, you know, data moves science and story moves culture. And so we're all here working on the data and the science and it'll move as fast as science moves. But the story, this narrative and people's access to more people and understanding the community. And I think that's going to move the culture. And, and I am seeing it move, you know, pretty quickly relative to my own expectations. Um, you know, drug development doesn't move any quicker. Unfortunately. <laughs> unless, it, unless it's a pandemic, but yes. <laughs> yeah, this is true. But uh, and nevertheless, we digress, but all informed by technology. And drug development can move quicker through data and tech. Like there are use cases, not in psychedelics necessarily yet, but but the use of uh, big databases from electronic health records to find the right inclusion exclusion criteria or um, design the right study or model things. There are ways people are simulating control groups or pragmatic clinical trials. So I think I think that's coming. That's a, a coming wave. And and another. Uh, thing I love, I love this uh, topic because um, I I think uh, as as useful and beautiful as apps are, um, we don't need them to be able to use tech to advance this. We could do it in little ways. In addition to that, uh, alongside that, like we'll have clients set reminders on their phone or watch to have have uh, a prompt to check in with their nervous system a certain number of times each day or ask themselves, what am I feeling? Or reminders about practices in sport integration or deploy them in a course, like we mentioned, Kelsey mentioned breath work, or we'll get them some meditation, mindfulness, breath work skills before entering a psychedelic therapy session um, or simulate one through uh, you know, a VR partnership in order to prepare. And these are all ways that are really accessible out there through technology and, and data that we can all reach for right now. Great, that's a good point. And I feel like you've already half answered the question I was gonna ask next. Um, you know, you've worked with ketamine and psychedelics as a researcher and clinician for a really long time. I'm really curious to hear about your personal experiences with technology um, in a clinical setting for psychedelics. You know, what are the benefits you've seen there? What are the potential drawbacks? You know, it's a it's a good question. There are so many um, potential components to it or answers there. But I think the biggest uh, uh, game changer I've seen over the past 10 years, you know, with being involved in thousands and thousands of ketamine therapy sessions is, you know, having, um, you know, an EHR, having widespread access to the Internet and having more and more tools has let us really deploy these important pieces um, to improve care and uh, track outcomes, and also uh, you know do things more efficiently by, uh, like I mentioned earlier, giving rating scales or assessments before someone even comes in the door that they can do on their smartphone, or so we can extract data from the EHR with a simple query instead of where we used to have to pull paper charts or go through jump through a lot of hoops to um, manually generate a spreadsheet and uh, and look at it that way. So it really, technology already has been game changing for this uh, when you look at it that way, but we're just, we're just at the beginning. Rowan, let's turn to you. I know that Field Trip has an app and my understanding is that it's for the patients who come into the Field Trip clinics and receive ketamine treatments. You know, I, I don't know how involved you were in the development of that, but you know, I'd love to hear a little bit about why you decided to include certain things versus not. Sure. So we, we actually have two technology platforms at Field Trip. We have our app uh, called Trip, um, which is really designed for more self-guided uh, consciousness expanding activities. Uh, and then we have Portal, which is more designed for the inpatient experience uh, at, at our clinics. Uh, were, was your question more specifically targeted towards Trip or, or Portal? The Trip. Trip. Uh, yeah. So, so Trip was born... Um, we fit on a couple of the themes uh, of the uh, initiation of trip on the, this conversation, which was as we were starting to build out our clinical infrastructure and, and develop the protocols uh, that people go through uh, in, in terms of delivering a consistent 
a high quality experience, at least to great therapeutic outcomes um, for our in-clinic experience. It was happening right at the same time that Denver and Oakland and I don't know how many other cities and states have now decriminalized drugs. Uh, now Toronto apparently is going to be decriminalizing all drugs, which is super cool. Um, and we looked about and we realized that clinical infrastructure scales on a pretty linear basis. Um, and the number of people who were going to be choosing to do consciousness expanding activities uh, was going to be expanding on a log, uh, exponential basis with these decriminalization efforts. And most people don't understand the difference between decriminalization and legalization. It's a very different thing, but it sounds the same thing to many people in their heads. And so we realized that all these protocols that we we're developing, which were, I think are very powerful protocols and techniques, you know, could be simplified and synthesized and put into an app such that even though we'd never encourage anyone to go out and do a psychedelic experience on their own, we're also not naive and realize that there's going to be lots of people going out and doing psychedelic experiences on their own. Um, so we realized that in a way to help, you know, help build this movement and help people ensure good experiences and avoiding the biggest risk what we're talking about in all psychedelic experiences by and large is, is the so-called bad trip. So if we can give people the tools and the understanding and the equipment to um, minimize risk of bad trip, if they're doing something without professional guidance was something that I think would serve the entire industry, um, would serve a lot of people and, and would help get this conversation going to a much larger audience. And so Trip was born out of that and Trip has kind of evolved from uh, its initial format, which was really just a, a simple journaling tool of set an intention, record your thoughts, do some integration and reflection questions. And now we've built in a lot of information and, and, and just basic understanding because what I learned, you know, speaking of technology at the code conference last week uh, was that there's a lot of people who are very interested in psychedelics, but still very scared about them and more information, more data. Uh, we were fortunate Scott Galloway, um, professor Scott G on, on the podcast uh, thought of us as like the William Sonoma of, of psychedelics. And now he feels comfortable to actually try it because he didn't know where there was a relevant or valid source of data uh, and information. Um, uh, but, you know, um, just providing all of that information so people can get like objective data, start to understand exactly what, what psychedelics are about, how they work, what the experience is going to be like, providing meditation so people can, you know, be prepared for their psychedelic experience, whether it's in our clinics, whether they're doing it on their own, um, you know, music to support the experience. Kelsey mentioned Lucid. Uh, you know, we were fortunate that uh, East Forest released his album In, which is, you know, psychedelic music for ketamine experiences on on the trip app. And, and so it's it's experience. And, and so it's for uh, our patients who come into the clinic and continue to do work, whether it's meditation or breath work or otherwise, after they leave the clinic. Uh, and it's for all the other people who are just trying to understand exactly what's going on, because as much as this conversation is rooted in a, in a very uh, medical and healthcare uh, format and, and paradigm, uh, it's probably a smaller fraction of what's actually happening out there uh, in the real world. So uh, that was part of the thinking about why we structured it the way we did. In terms of inclusion and exclusion criteria, I, I couldn't really give any uh, kind of details of that because it's a constantly evolving conversation and what was once out may now be back be in and, and, and vice versa. That's a good point. Reed and Ronan, I, I sort of want to turn to you guys for a hot second because you know, you're a part of companies that has this network of clinics administering ketamine. We've talked a little bit about the technologies that currently are available. You know, is, is there a technology out there in your mind that you really, really would like in the context of ketamine therapy or psychedelics therapy that just isn't available now, but you know, in five years time, we really hope it will be? Reed, I'm going to toss that one to you first while I think about that. <laughs> sure, I'll just uh, I'll give a, a broad initial answer that uh, you know psychedelic therapy still needs a killer app. You know, we talk about that in the software world of one that that really uh, takes us leaps and bounds forward in terms of, and I think it will be um, you know something connected to the the health record to make it usable but patient facing individualized uh, that can support the whole journey, you know, practices it, to support integration is probably one of the biggest areas uh, ripe for transformation. Um, and because of that big cost of uh, therapy hours, um, but, uh, but also for the screening, the evaluation, the prep, the integration, the tracking outcome and uh, the uh, 
storing the data in a structured way where we can continually improve health outcomes and health economics along the way. Um, so I'd see it as uh, you know, an integrate, integrated uh, app or set of apps uh, tied into the EHR that are um, not uh, having clinicians sacrifice efficiency and that gives the patients a beautiful experience, uh, but then improves outcomes for everyone. Uh, having had the benefit of the the minute read afforded me uh, there, and you know, I think uh, I think I agree, but I would offer a slightly different spin on it, and I'd be very curious to hear Kelsey's answer as well. Which is, like, I think the way we measure mental health is very two dimensional, maybe even one dimensional. If I think about what is actually involved, and in, and I don't even know what we're actually aiming for, whether it's human happiness or resilience, like it, it's really hard to even define what we're hoping to achieve with psychedelic therapies. But I think the technology that enables us to get a lot more three dimensional or four dimensional or five dimensional about what it is that enables human happiness, fulfillment, all that kind of stuff. You know, we, we talk about as a, as a simple example, like the mystical experience and in, in psychedelic experiences having an impact on, on the therapeutic outcomes. It's like, we don't really understand what that means. Like we have like this very basic measure of it. Can we get more three dimensional? I, I read an article recently about how awe and mental health are very, uh, awe and happiness, I think are, are very tightly correlated. Uh, and, and these are things that are really hard to measure in a conventional data driven scientific medical paradigm, but I think they're incredibly relevant to what we're talking about here uh, and so the app that starts to give more texture uh, to all of these things like energy and awe and mysticism uh, and can give a more three-dimensional or holographic perspective of what it is to be human uh, or conscious uh, is going to be the killer app for psychedelics i i agree just tagging into what both you fellas said so what reed described is what we're building have built it's in beta it's uh, exciting times for us, but it's this idea of not just data, but going to with insight and then to wisdom. So a bunch of data is just like numbers and things lying around. It's making sense of it that matters. And then I think the next thing is this idea of like, what is we, I describe it as mental wealth. So wealth can not necessarily just mean dollars. It means health. It means uh, fulfillment. It means richness of life, all these kind of things. Um, and I think I think that is the brighter future is really getting to the UI UX, not to geek a bit, but as opposed to saying, how are you feeling one, one to 10 or emoji smiley face, it, you know, exploring options to say what color most represents how you're feeling with the palette and people can orient themselves to sentiment and self and this idea of um, connecting to that all or this sense that we have our own experience in life that isn't you know, on our old MBA quadrant or a good old matrix is I think where we're headed, where we allow people to inform what that looks like. So, I mean, bright future, there's a million opportunities. It's, uh, it's exciting, but I think, but I think this drive beyond data to insight, to wisdom, to this like wealth experiences, I think where we're all hoping to head. Great. Thank yeah, you guys. No. You Sorry. Added, go ahead. Uh, you know, a whole new layer to it. it just reminds me of after after ketamine, just like I've uh, done after psychedelic therapy sessions with other medicines abroad. Uh, I'll give the mystical experience questionnaire and the emotional breakthrough inventory because we know from the psilocybin data that you get a high mystical experience and have a challenging one through mm. the emotional breakthrough inventory, you're more likely to have lasting change. So that kind of thing can be measured through technology quite easily. Just deploy the questionnaires to someone in an app uh, or by email or hand them good old fashioned paper and pencil after and then put it in technology. And we can not only help them transform, but we can learn more and more about the medicines going forward and see how our music did and all those other components. Perfect. Well, thank you guys. Um, I actually had one more question, but I feel like the answers are going to be quite long and we won't be able to get to them. But, you know, with around 45 seconds left on the clock, it, it, like, you know, are there any final thoughts that you wanted to get to our audience in terms of the intersection between psychedelics and tech? You guys each have 15 seconds. Go. Run and go. <laughs> okay, I'll go quickly. Uh, it's just getting started. Like, let your mind be the source of imagination because you're, we're not even close to really thinking about the potential here. Like, we're just really just scratching the surface. 
Yeah, I would agree entirely. I would just think about, you know, ancient medicine, modern technology, and this idea of bringing the two together really uh, gracefully to unlock something entirely different. And, and, you know, that we can't presuppose how great this can be, um, because I think generation after generation, whatever we're doing to the power of, um, really, really can change everything. And I'm tremendously excited to see what happens. Agreed. The future, the future indeed looks very bright. Like we've been saying, we need more conversations like this to keep uh, pushing for it. So thank you all. All right. Well, we are officially over time. Thank you guys all so much. I hope our audience enjoyed our conversation and everyone take care. <laughs>